Well, hi there. Welcome to Love at First Laugh, the green room edition. Today, I'm so excited because I have an amazing guest that I've known for 15 years. We did a show together in Chicago 15 years ago, and she actually helped me sell my t-shirts, which I will never forget. She's such a cool person and so talented. Uh, you actually can see her on uh, her Amazon special, The Floor is Lava. She also has a special called Pacifically Speaking. You can also watch it on Amazon. Uh, she was on Jimmy Kimmel Live, on Kevin Can Wait, uh, The Connors. I'm reading all her credits. It's like an incredible list. We'll be here all day if I read them all. Uh, she is actually, uh, she launched a podcast in 2019 called Mess in Progress. I love that. We're going to learn all about Gina, her journey, and you'll see what a cool person she is and why I love her. Please welcome Gina Brion. Hi, Gina. <laughs> how are you i'm doing great how are you oh, i'm good i'm good i'm tired new mom life and everything it's tough oh my god you have a baby now yes girl oh had a baby god. a few weeks ago um ooh, i'm in his room right now shush oh shush yeah <laughs> This oh, will be his room when he can appreciate that it will be his room. But right now he sleeps in a bassinet. Um, <laughs> right. He doesn't know any better. Yeah. Oh, he's in his room for work. He don't know that yet. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your journey because uh, it's fascinating because you started when you were a teenager. Yeah, I started around 17, I think on the cusp of turning 18. Uh, around that time, God, it's been so many years ago. I'm like, how old why again? Like, you know, when it goes that far back, we're just like, I don't remember <laughs> that era of time anymore. But yeah, that I was uh, very young when I started. Um, I just I fell in love with stand up young. I just did. I fell in love with it at 14 years old, and um, I always was a fan of comedy since I was a kid. But at 14, I saw my first stand-up comedian, and that was it. I was sold. I was like, "This is. I want to do this for the rest of my life." I was like, "I don't. I don't know how. I didn't. I don't even think I contemplated like a path. I was just like, I have no idea how I'm going to do it, but I'm just going to thrust myself into this world. And that's kind of what I did. I just I became obsessed with it. And thankfully, my mom, who very much supported my family, has always been very supportive. My mom entered me and my sister in a contest called the funniest person from the Bronx contest. And it was at Stand Up New York. So Stand Up New York was the first club I ever performed at. Wow. Uh, in New York City. And uh, once I got on stage that first time, it was, you know, that was my addiction. That became a thing. I was like, oh no, I'm gonna figure out how I can do this always. That's amazing. So your passion is like a hundred percent. There's no, oh. Did you ever have any had any doubts during your journey? Like, oh my God, I don't want I want to quit. I want to. Did you ever have that? Several times, man. Yeah. I mean, to this day, to this day, <laughs> you know, it's going good. You're just like, you're just like, I don't. You know, sometimes you just, you know, it's not even about the stuff not going your way. Sometimes you're just exhausted yeah. in so many ways and drained in so many ways because what people don't understand, I think particularly about stand-up is that it's non-stop work. And when I say that, people I know go, yeah, right. Like, I'm like, no, it's it's non-stop. It is yeah. literally, even when I'm not working, I'm working. Just because I'm not on stage does not mean I'm not working, especially in the beginning stages because you're the everything person. You are the talent, you are the booker, you are the manager, you are the agent, you're everybody. Everybody, you're a PR person, everything. Yeah. And now you're a social media mogul at this point. You know, you're <laughs> Exactly. There are a million things that you have to be, especially in the beginning. And that never really leaves. Like, you know, yeah. even when you get the manager, even when you get the agent, there's still so much of the work is still dependent on you. I always say this, the reason why a lot of like industry people get uh, and they get a valuable 10% of what you make is because 90% of it is still on you. The 10% that they do is invaluable. I will say this, like when you get a good team of people, I have an amazing team of people that I love. You yeah. look at that and you go, I can't believe you guys do this for only 10% of what I'm <laughs> right. Like you do all of us for that amount, but you have to accept also that 90% of it is on you. Absolutely. And it's on your work ethic and how far you're willing to push yourself and how much you're willing to push yourself. Cause man, especially for the females in this business, like I hate to be so, you know, black and white about it, yeah. but 
yeah. I can speak from that experience. You know, mm -hmm. Latina being a female, like ladies be ready to work a lot yeah. harder than a lot of the guys. Sorry guys, like I know you guys work hard, but I'm telling yeah. you, as somebody who's experienced it, the amount of work we have to put in to prove ourselves, to, mm -hmm. to get even a portion of as far as a lot of the guys do, like it's it's a lot. Absolutely. Do you feel that people are more willing to listen to a male comic than a female comic? And that's why we have to be better, <laughs> like really good? I feel like to a certain extent, yes, because I've been in certain situations where I can look at the audience and the minute I come on stage and they see that it's a female comic, I can see some of the men in the audience tune out. Like I've been oh. in a situation where men will just tune out. I've been in a situation where women will tune out because they're not supportive of female comics. You know, I would say as much as I get uh, men who come up to me after shows and go, you know, I don't normally think women are funny, but you're funny. I get that from women too. So I can't just point the, you know, the finger of blame at the men because I get it from women too that come up to other women that come up to me and go, I don't normally find women funny. And I'm like, you seem great. Uh, as as a as a fellow woman saying that to another woman, you seem like yeah. a gem of a human person. Uh, <laughs> I just I've I've heard it so many times, and I I would have I it would be I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel like men do get listened to more often. And I've yeah. literally I was talking to a, a comic years ago, and she had gone and she had done a show, and they said, "Oh, thank God you were funny." The last female comic we had here was uh 10 years ago and they haven't booked another one since oh my god so you can't tell me like i've seen a ton of unfunny guys people <laughs> like it's, Thank you. there's more unfunny guys than unfunny women to be well, honest there's also more men than there is women so of there's course women, right right guys and there are unfunny women but it's like there's unfunny both the difference is yeah. like we're unfunny once a lot of times we won't ever get booked again. Whereas yeah. the same guy could be unfunny five times in a row and they'll be like, oh, he's just growing. He's developing oh. this. And, it, and you're just like, what am I doing? Right. So they give man breaks and they don't give us a break, basically. Well, yeah, they give us harder. Like everything, you know, yeah. our bodies, our faces, our everything they judge us harder than a man this isn't even like a lot i feel like some people look at that and they go oh there go women crying again about how much like <laughs> this is a problem and it's like no we're just we literally this is what we deal with on the right this is what we have to shrug off thank you to be successful we have to be able to brush our shoulders off and be like yeah. Yeah, that, that's just it is what it is and we have to kind of plow through that absolutely yeah uh, we have uh, a question actually because I I do we I read the comments for everybody. Thank you everyone for commenting. <laughs> Not all the comments show for some reason. I don't know why Streamyard does that. But here's Dave um, and he's asking Gina. Let's hear about your time on NBC Stand Up for Diversity Showcase, which you won. Oh, yeah, 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 that was. You know what's crazy? I'll tell you this story because I love telling the story for um, comics that question joining showcases. I personally hate comedy competitions 100 yeah. percent. my manager knows this everybody that you know has ever booked me knows this i do not like stand-up comedy competitions i think it creates an ugly atmosphere for comics and mm -hmm. it feeds that need that we are competing with each other as if we don't all have individual voices and individual paths to take and so many, like look at how many successful comics there are like they're not all the same and so i'm not really a huge fan of it but i had done the showcase especially in the beginning you have to do showcases as a newer comic for several reasons the first one being networking is the biggest reason you have to do showcases you just have to you get to meet other comics that have other rooms you get to meet industry people those industry people do remember you and they will watch you if you've made it to one showcase that they see you on on two or three more showcases they're like oh this i keep seeing this face i keep hearing this name and so in the beginning i did quite a few um the nbc one i had done it wasn't until my third time that i won which is why i tell people you know i didn't win the first time i didn't like and and i was i wasn't really bummed i was just like oh well you know, I did it. That's it. That's all I was like, oh, I did it. The second time I did it, um, I think I made it to the second round. I think I made it to the second round the first and the second time I did it, but I just, it never went anywhere from there. And then the third time I wasn't even going to do it. Wow. I wasn't even going to do it the third time. I was like, you know what? Maybe it's not for me. Obviously I'm not good at competitions. That's what I really thought. I thought I'm not a competitive person, so I'm not good yeah. at competitions. 
So I wasn't going to do it. And then it was my boyfriend at the time who talked me into it because he ended up being their videographer for the whole thing. And he said, well, I'm going to be working with them anyway. Why don't you just sign up and do it again? Nice. And that year that me and John Laster won. And it was, I mean, that was a great year. I mean, we were all really supportive of each other. I have to say like there was no hate or competition. We were literally all at that point in our careers. I think everybody who was, you know, involved in that year was just at a point in their career where they were like, look, this is really about me trying to get management. This is really about me trying to get an agent, whether I win or not. And actually that's how I got my first, um, my first management and agency team was through that showcase. I ended up signing with Levity. Um, and then I ended up at Innovative and, you know, everything changed throughout the years, but that was how initially how I got representation was doing a showcase. So as much as I don't like comedy competition. Yeah, they're good. And showcases are competitions, however you want to call it, like showcases are competitions. There is always a prize. There's always something you're competing for. But the bigger thing with showcases is you get seen by industry people. So I always say, if you're a comic, do showcases, man. Unless you're in a position where you already have representation, then you don't really need them. Um, But you can can get better representation, too. I mean, yeah, because yeah, I mean, the names who are levity, innovative. I mean, they're great agencies, you know. So, yeah, you, definitely. You can get if you have representation, and they, I always do this. Like whenever my reps or whatever will recommend something to me, I always I'm like, well, why should I do it? Like I want to hear <laughs> them on an industry perspective. Like why should I do it? I may not like competition shows, but like why should I do one now? Yeah. Or what, what benefit would it be for me in my career? And they'll be able to explain to you, if you have a really good team of people, they'll be able to tell you, look, this is how it will benefit you at this point in your career to do a showcase or to do a competition show. Because some people, I mean, your social media numbers go up. I mean, I know people that have done AGT that their numbers jump. They get like they get better bookings. So yeah. there are reasons to do them. It just depends on what trajectory you're looking for, I think, in your career. Totally. And you fit in. If you're like a yeah. super filthy comic, maybe you don't do America's Got Talent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're a clean comic, aren't you? You're pretty clean. Yeah, pretty clean. And I've always thought about like, okay, what would it be like if I wasn't clean at this point? But I'm so used to it now. Really? You know, I'm so used to working clean. Okay. Um, and I love the fact that I have um, kids that are fans. I love oh, the fact God. that they can do my comedy. I love the fact that I'll get hit up by like, you know, a oh, family and be like, yeah, me and my daughters, we watched your comedy special. Like the fact that they can watch it together. I don't want to lose that. I love that. That's I wish great. I had that as a kid. I wish yeah. I had stuff that I could like sit and watch with my family. And there was only certain stand-up comics I was really permitted to watch to a certain extent, you know, as a 14-year-old kid in my household. So I enjoy the fact that I get to have fans like that. And um, I think, I mean, because in real life, I cuss like a sailor sometimes. <laughs> Same here, I know. <laughs> I'm like, I cuss like a sailor in real life. So, Debbie, meet me in real life. Don't be surprised if there's a yeah. couple of <laughs> Yeah. I, I just, it's so natural in real life to get frustrated and, and say that stuff. Yeah. But on stage, it's like second nature to me. It's just like I go, I almost omit them on purpose. Like every now and then something will slip out like a, a very G-rated cuss word will slip yeah. out. It's very rare. It's really rare. Yeah, because I watch your specials. It's like super clean. Like yeah. anybody, yeah, anybody. And I love that you have kids as your fans. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. So it, it's great. It's great. So, uh, you know, I also work with kids. I love, well, not also work with kids, but I work with kids and I love kids. And um, what do you think we should be teaching kids today? Oh, man. A million things. I could teach a course on what kids should be taught. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, a lot of it is very new agey. Yeah. I mean, like when I think about how I was raised and the things that were taught to me or omitted from my education, um, I think we need a really big education rehaul, honestly. Yeah, I agree. Um, Teach accurate historical events, Mm -hmm. accurate historical events. Mm-hmm. figures and what they stood for in reality and not what we praise them for. Um, I love that. In terms of, you know, everybody was worried about when schools were teaching sex ed and schools shouldn't teach sex ed. I think not only do we need sex ed in schools, um, but I think we also need to teach um, emotional intelligence. And we also need yes. to 
a lot of things that we don't involve in in sexual education when it comes to schools yes. that is the intellectual side of all that is <laughs> consent is this is that like we don't teach all of that and i think if we encompass that i think that would be amazing to put mm -hmm. in school. as many people are probably gonna be like oh no i would never how could you um where would you rather your kids learn this in the street mm -hmm. because growing up that's where all the kids i grew up with learned it and guess what a lot of those girls ended up pregnant that's right at a very yeah. young age because nobody was talking to them openly about their bodies nobody was talking to them mm -hmm. openly about sexual education and there was a lot of pressure on them to be the cool chick that hooked up with this guy and with nobody right. to guide you you know, you're going to try to fit in with whatever crowd you try to fit in with. So I think I mean, those are some of the elements. I think if we added that to education at all levels, too, because I think it changes as it goes. I think your emotional mm -hmm. and everything changes. As Absolutely. You, you know, mm -hmm. we would need it in high school. We would need it to some degree, some sort of psychological behavior classes in college as well. Yeah. You know, I agree. The behavior is can be extremely dangerous because there's alcohol involved or other substances and you're you know you're in college and you're not supervised and teaching people that personal responsibility i think would it would change a lot i think yeah no i agree i agree we we learn by experiencing things rather than by adults teaching us you know emotional intelligence is so important yes absolutely um, yeah a hundred percent so i wish that somebody would have taught me that because i always felt like i was emotionally you know very smart here, but emotionally not not very prepared for a lot of things. Yeah, absolutely. So, here. Yeah, I know. Same here. Yeah. So let's talk about your special, The Floor is Lava. I watched it and I loved it. It's amazing. You guys watch it. It's on Amazon Prime. The Floor is Lava. And what I love, the what, I love it all, but one of the things that I related to very much was the fact that you were talking about being a skin light Latina. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, light skin, skin light Latina, whatever. Skin light skin Latina. I was thinking yeah. Spanish right there. Uh, I have dyslexia, so I just flipped it in my brain. I was like, <laughs> that's what I heard, light skin. That's what she said. She said, yeah, 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 you know it. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know. Because in Spanish, it's like the opposite. Well, yeah. I mean, two languages now, but sometimes that happens in my brain because I grew up. I always it. loved your accent. Like, I, <laughs> so, it's so adorable. Oh, thank you. But nobody believes me. I'm Latina. They think I'm faking it. And so that's why I was like, oh, my God, I totally relate to her being a light skinned Latina, you know, and just being confused by any ethnicity but Latina. You know? I posted that bit to TikTok um, about being light skinned. And you yeah. know, which I really did hate my complexion growing up because. Aww. My mom was this beautiful, like olive skin. Oh, gorgeous! I just, I mean, my mom is already beautiful, but that skin yeah. tone I thought was so beautiful, yeah. and I hated the fact that I was lighter than my mom. I hated the fact that I wasn't identifiably ethnic. And I posted yeah. this bit to TikTok, and the hilarious argument that ensued <laughs> was whether or not I was light skinned enough to legitimately have that kind of problem. It's so stupid. Oh so, my God. Apparently, for a lot of these people, I was still not light skinned enough to hate my own complexion. Like, they're literally telling me what my problem How could that possibly be my problem? And between that and people saying, like, oh, she's not light skinned black. And I'm like, oh. I'm, I'm like, you guys are missing everything that I'm saying here. You're missing the entire. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, light skinned black. I mean, first of all, thank you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Black yeah. is beautiful. <laughs> that is a part of my heritage being Puerto Rican. However, um, I'm still not identifiably ethnic, nor have I ever been thought of, except for the people on TikTok, as light skinned black. Like, is, you're not, I look more light skinned Latina than I will ever look light skinned black, in my opinion. Although, yeah. because it is part of my heritage, I can't deny that I'm like, you know, I have a couple features. Uh, but I really wished I was, the whole time growing up, I really mm -hmm. wanted be darker skinned. I well, hate right here. Skin for so yeah. many years and mainly because right I would be around other Latin people and I didn't speak good Spanish. My oh. skin was light. I had no discernible, like I had no accent whatsoever. Like I just have a, I don't even have a New York accent. I just, I have a, maybe yeah, you have like a very neutral accent. Yeah. And so I felt very, 
apart from everyone. I felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb. And my Spanish is better, much better now. Um, but because I didn't speak a lot of Spanish, I had no way of proving to these people that I was Latina enough for them. Well, you see, I, that's my advantage because I grew up in Argentina and I came here to, you know, for college. Yeah. It's like, oh, really? You don't think I'm Latina? Entonces, mira, que gente te empieza a hablar en español así de rápido, no vas a entender absolutamente nada. They're like, okay, yes, you are Latina. Yeah. Yeah. To this day, I still have people that like, and it, it frustrates me so much. I have people that say stuff to me like, well, you're not really that Latina. Oh, or, well, she what doesn't. Does that mean? That and, and it just, it infuriates me when I hear that, especially from people that are my friends that they're yeah. making a joke. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, that's such a disrespectful thing to say to yeah. somebody. Like, oh, you're not really that Latina. Oh, oh totally. Totally, they do that. I've, in college, they were like, "You know, you're you're pretty cool for a Latina. You're pretty cool for a Latina." Yeah, wait, wait, what did you just say? Yeah, you're saying Latinos are not cool. You're pretty. You know, you're saying, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Should I start stabbing you now? <laughs> How do we change this status? <laughs> well, they don't expect that from this, you know. No, no. So when I go a little get on them, they're like, "Okay." <laughs> What just happened here? You pressed the wrong button. Sorry. Yeah. That's what it, is. You the wrong button. it happens to you too, right? Oh, yeah. You hit that get yeah. button. It, it'll come out of me like <laughs> you know, heartbeat. I have more control over it now, but whoo. <laughs> I think as we get older, we kind of chill a little bit, you know, in general. <laughs> it's it's good. Good. We just realize it's not, worth, it's not worth the upset, but there's no. that part of you that somebody can always push you to that point. Where your head gets to swivel in and it is over. It's a wrap for everybody. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you done unleash the beast now. Yeah. Do you have any funny stories about like people not expecting you to like go get on them? Or any special stories? Um no, because I do it normally if I have to now, I find a really professional way of doing it. Oh, I can't deal with that. Wait, why you find a professional way to do it? Okay, give me an example. I want to see the professional go and ghetto. I'll tell you this story because one of my favorite stories, God, I hope my manager's watching. Jenny, if you're watching right now, you'll remember this and it'll make you laugh. Um, I was uh, sitting in a meeting with a, with an agent and this person uh -huh. was talking to me like I was a first year comic. Now, mind you, I am 20 some odd years in the game. Mm-hmm. So he's already being very disrespectful in even the things he's suggesting. And I'm sitting there and I'm taking it all in because it's kind of what I expected from this person. I, you know, when I go to a meeting with somebody, I do my homework, I do my research on them. Good. So I did my research on this person. I knew he wasn't really as big of a player in the game as he was trying to play out. So mm -hmm. when we were talking, he insinuated that it would be hard to book me at comedy clubs because um, basically I'm not like at like Kevin Hart status, I'm not selling out theaters, I'm not, I'm not doing that. So it'd be hard to book me at comedy clubs. Um, so he would suggest that we do smaller venues. Basically was trying to get me into these little hood spots because he didn't oh, want yeah. to do, you know, deal with comedy clubs. And he said, and, and this is what I told him verbatim, I will never forget this. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you know, actually, the last agency I was with, I had a phenomenal touring agent, and she did so much great work laying a great foundation at the clubs that mm -hmm. any agent that can't book me at clubs, it speaks more to their ineptitude as an agent than it does to my ability to be booked. Now, see, kids, what I did there was essentially, I told this man, if you can't book me, you suck, not me. You suck at your job because the foundation's already been laid down. I didn't have to get in his face. I didn't have to finger wave. <laughs> he already knew he was put in his place. I love it. Because it was like, okay, I have to put you in your place now. Mm -hmm. you, you really overstepped. You've been overstepping. Yeah. You really overstepped now. Mm -hmm. But there's a few things you have to remember, especially, okay, as a female, as a woman of color, in a meeting with somebody, if I bug out, I'm the problem. Right. It doesn't matter what was said mm -hmm. to me, it doesn't matter how disrespectful it was, mm -hmm. if I mouth off at you now, 
now I'm the problem. I'm the, the stank Puerto Rican girl. I'm the right with an attitude. Yeah, an attitude. I'm difficult to work with because mm -hmm. I stood up for myself because I went off on you because I told you this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. So knowing all of that, I had to. I really had to take a step back mentally and just be like, all right. As much as I really want to go off on you right now, I have to put it in these words. Nice. And that's kind of like the professional way of being like, oh no, you didn't. <laughs> you should do a bit about that. That's delicious. I did a bit about it in uh, in the floor is lava. I talk about hood me versus evolved yeah. me. The evolved you, that's yeah. Where it comes from evolved me is the person that sat in that meeting like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> hood me was in the background like, you want to talk to us like that? You want to let them talk to us like that? You just gonna let them say that? You gonna let them disrespect oh. us? I got this. <laughs> I got this. Let me handle this. And evolved me has to step in and do the nice tell off and be like, okay. Well. I love that. That is so great. And in my head, me and hood me high five. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I love it, girl. That's amazing. Uh, so let's jump to a more shallow topic. Okay. Ooh, so yeah, let's, yeah, let's go shallow a little bit for a, for a minute. Um, so you, you talk about going into the dating world and having a host stroll phase. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. So in this weird dating world, how do you feel being a single Latina is different from being a single white person, woman? Um, how do you feel it's different? Well, one, we're fetishized more. Yes, we are. Oh, my God. Yes. Fetishized. Like, it becomes yeah. the thing of, like, oh, I'm dating a Latina. And they're, you yeah. know, yeah. A couple of white dudes that like I had gone on dates with that did even in fact say that like boy you know I've never dated a Latina before and I'm like oh, good for you. I'll alert the authorities I don't know what you want, <laughs> you want a parade congratulations you bagged me probably the lowest on the totem pole of Latinas you were hoping to get um, oh my God. I'm I'm not that Latina I don't know if you've heard <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're, we're fetishized more. So I think yeah. the, way the, the dating game is different for us. Yeah. Uh, it does become a thing where people want to date outside of their race. And, you know, they hear all these things about Latin women and, oh, we're fired. Yeah. We're this and we're that. And um, to a certain extent, I think by certain races, we are either looked at as, you know, easy to get in bed or hard yeah. to get in bed. Really? Yeah, because I'll hear from a lot of my Black and Latino friends that, you know, Latin women are the hardest to impress enough for you to get to that stage with them. Mm -hmm. But then from a lot of white guys, it's like we're looked at as easy prey. And I'm yeah. like, because they think Spanish and sexy and we're all about sexuality. And, and I'm like, no, most of us are Catholic and riddled with guilt. Like, yes, thank you. Yes, we are. <laughs> We're actually, yeah. we're actually I'm more likely to sleep with you. I don't sleep with you. Yeah. <laughs> like, we're riddled with guilt. No. <laughs> so, yeah, we are. Absolutely. And so, I think I think that changes it for us too. Um, yeah. You know, and a lot of us, at least for me too, like depending on where your family values lie, like it's hard in the dating world now. At least I found it hard. What I found it hard for me just personally, whether it's a Latina thing or not, yeah. is I wanted a legitimate, solid relationship. I wanted to be with somebody. Mm -hmm. And I became so frustrated with the dating world. Mm -hmm. And I really did just decide. I was like, yo, I'm going to have a whole phase. I'm going to have a selfish whole phase <laughs> where I don't care about none of y'all's feelings. That's it. Yeah. And yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Isn't it fun, though? It's fun, but it's, it's a great so way to be. Fun. <laughs> I made <laughs> Many mistakes were made. I apologize publicly to all those who, who may have been hurt by my mistakes. Yeah. Many mistakes were made, but you go Sorry. through the selfish phase of like, you yeah. know, I'm tired of being taken advantage of. I'm tired yeah. of not getting what I want. I'm tired of, you know, yeah. all these people that need to date four or five other people to decide whether or not they like me enough to date me. I, I was tired of all of that. I was, But I'm also a very decisive person but to a fault like mm -hmm. i'll date somebody yeah. and be like i'll go on a couple days with somebody and i'll be like cool i like you want to be my boyfriend no all right oh my god cool. i'm the same way yes yes <laughs> I just, yeah. it, was, it, it was hard for me to date casually because yeah. once i find somebody that i really like to spend time with it's like i don't need to date three or four other people to make up my mind about this mm -hmm. person 
but I ran into so many men that just, that's what they needed. They were like, well, you know, I'm not looking for anything serious. And I'm like, then what are we doing? Yeah. Why, why are you seeing me? I've told you what I want. Yeah. It's silly. Yeah. Dating is essentially an interview process for your next boyfriend or husband or whatever, where you're just like, (laughs) yeah, you're like, all right, call him the next guy. No, you know, lately, like when somebody pretended to be interested because they wanted to get me, you know, in bed, mm-hmm. um, I would be like, you know, you wasted my time. You really did. And they're like, nah, because we have friends. I'm like, look, I have a lot of friends. I don't need another friend who wastes my time like you do. My friends don't waste my time. You just exactly. waste my time. <laughs> I'm not a friend. Yeah, you're not a friend. Not interested in keeping in touch. Good luck to you. Don't sleep with my friends. <laughs> that's all you could have told me that at the beginning if this end goal was for us to end up you know intimately involved yeah you have said the friendship thing i would have put you in the friend category i don't sleep with my friends so thank you right yeah the dating I- world was very confusing and annoying and so i was ready to go into that um short-lived whirlwind of a hoe phase uh <laughs> Cause I wasn't very good at it. I wasn't, I just wasn't. Oh, very. No. Why not? Tell me why were you were not good at it? Because I'm a guilt ridden person. Like oh, I'm it's- selfish or stupid or, you know, and all I would do is berate myself and beat myself up and be like, you know, that was a really dumb move on your part or this person got hurt because of your actions or, you know, I, I could never just, you know, I feel like casual dating, we should concentrate more on the casualty of it all. Casual <laughs> causes casualties. And because of that, it was like I, you know, I couldn't I couldn't deal with the guilt. Like I really couldn't. Right. I really, it was really tough. It was really it's tough. A lot. But then how else are you gonna find somebody? You know, you have to go on these stupid apps. Um it's mm-hmm. it, do you think like the the Catholic guilt were you raised Catholic? My mom and dad were raised Catholic. I was raised um I was sort of raised in the church, but we popped around to several different churches. Like we were, uh, my mom and dad decided to leave the Catholic church after a while for different reasons. And they went to a Presbyterian church. So I grew up in a Presbyterian church. I went to both a a majority white Presbyterian church and an all Latino Presbyterian church. Hmm. And then um, later on in life, I went to an apostolic church. I was in the apostolic church for seven years. Apostolic is in way of the apostles. Think Pentecostal, essentially. Oh, okay. One of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a big leap for me because Presbyterianism was like, you know, that was like white stuff. That was, yeah, that was like, do you read the Bible? Great. You passed. Go ahead. <laughs> it's not that simple. Yeah, it was really like, you read the Bible? Good. Jesus saves everybody. Let's have some cake. And then yeah. um, Apostolic Church was way more like, you know, you know, there was no makeup. There was no jewelry, you know, oh. pants, you know. Ooh. So everything about me changed when I went to the apostolic Mm -hmm. church, but I have nothing but love for the apostolic church. Honestly, 100% changed my life for the better in, in many ways. Um, and I do believe that the church is a great foundation for anybody to have. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel that way about church. I feel that way about martial arts. I feel that way about, um, some athletic training. It sets a good foundation for respect and for growth and and everything. So done the right way. I do realize that, you know, people that grew up with religious backgrounds have suffered a lot uh, from just the hypocrisy of life. The thing is with like people in church, and I have this debate with people all the time um, about the hypocrisy in church. They're like, well, church people are such hypocrites. I'm like, no, they're human. And they mess up like you do and like I do. It's just that they're under a microscope. And when they mess up, it's magnified because they spend so much of their time trying not to mess up. Exactly. But we're all human and we're going to mess up no matter what. Yeah, nobody's perfect. I'm the most imperfect human being. <laughs> I screw up so much. So much. And I will continue to screw up. It's part of life. You know what I mean? Like, And so I've always looked at it like that. So my relationship with the apostolic church and with those people was such an amazing blessing because I learned so much about myself. I rebuilt a relationship, you know, with my faith and, you know, and it, it was a very great time in my life that I remember fondly. Um, I have fond memories of the church. I never put that on anybody else, but I know for me, I'm like, not all church people are terrible. Let's not put them all in that category. Of course. People that have had trauma always tend to think of like, 
all church people, if they've experienced trauma because of the church or because of religion, they, you know, feel that way. Yeah. Like, you know, that religion does put in your mind, like, what does it mean to be a good person? And when you're doing that and you're in the dating world and you're like, oh, am I, am I a bad person? I'm a terrible person because mm -hmm. I'm selfish and I've been this and I've been that and you have to hit the reset button. So in a way, I'm sort of thankful for that guilt mm -hmm. because it helped me reset. But, you know, uh, guilt is never a great feeling, but sometimes it's a necessary feeling. And I think it helps me, you know, not pull me out of the whole phase because honestly, meeting my husband is what pulled me out of the whole phase. But uh, <laughs> I know I am hoping somebody will put me out of that face. I've been in that face for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I go in and out of it. You know, sometimes I'm like two years of no. Because like when I think you know, and I've always said this, like you know when you've met the person that you cannot imagine your life without. I love that. Yeah, you just you just know. Yeah. And I think maybe not in that exact moment where I first saw my husband, but it was something different. It wasn't like really? when I had seen another guy and I thought, oh my God, that guy's cute. Or oh my God, that guy's hot. There was something different that was there when I saw him. There's a connection. There's something. Yeah. Yeah. That, that brings you to, to that person. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that that was that moment for me that I was like, Oh, I can't be a hoe no more. <laughs> no, but and you're happy though. That's it's a relief. Yeah, it's like how did I used to describe it? I, so this, I forget which uh, special. One of the specials I think I talk about um, what marriage is like and how marriage is like um, finding the perfect parking spot. Nice, I love that. When it's like it's finding it after you've been circling the block for the longest amount of time and mm -hmm. maybe you parked in a spot that you thought was the right spot, but you always kind of felt like you were in danger and didn't read the signs right. And so you sat in that spot for as long as you could tolerate it until one day you got so fed up that you just left that spot. And then you went around the block one last time and <laughs> where it was the perfect spot right there. And you must have passed it several times. I was right. <laughs> you were looking there. I and then you pull into that spot and you're just like, why uh, Why didn't I do this years ago? I wish right. I would have seen this spot. And so that's what it's, it's sort of like. You pull into that spot and you just, you settle in and you just, and the, in the thick of it too, because, you know, it's not all sunshine and roses. It never is in any relationship. It's always going to have ups and downs and periods of intensity. And mm -hmm. that especially happens the further your relationship goes with a single person where you're just like, you know, you both change as individuals throughout your relationship. You grow mm -hmm. and you change as people and as a unit. So okay. if you can go in and you know that, like, 100% well, marriage is not easy, but it's also kind of amazingly, epically dope to have somebody that you can count on. You know, somebody that's in your life that is going to be there for you, that you can turn to and say, hey, I need you. We, we all need that, that person. Oh, Let's absolutely. Get deep. Absolutely. That's great. I love it. I love how you put it. The parking spot. I won't forget that. Yeah. So I'm going to look at guys now as parking spots. <laughs> like, mm, you look like a tollway zone. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get a ticket. <laughs> yeah. This parking is super illegal. I'm going to get out of here. That's hilarious. I love it. So here we have another question by David, and he's saying, Gina, please talk about your experience oh. being featured on the Beyond the Fluffy tour last year. Um, it was phenomenal. Like, that's literally the only word to describe everything. It was so epic um, being on tour with Gabriel. One, he is one of my favorite people. Um, just as a human being, I adore him. He is oh. as, as cool as you think he is, magnify that by 10. Like, wow. as a human being, just on stage and off stage. He's amazing to watch on stage because I've seen this man. I think the most incredible thing I've seen him do or that blew my mind is, you know, watching him in an arena filled with, you know, 15,000 or more people. And he's so incredibly talented at creating the intimacy of a small venue in a large arena. Like oh, the wow. crowd is just with him. And you're just, 
I would sit, I would sit on the sides and I would watch him and I would just be in awe. I would be in absolute awe of how he got the crowd just right in the palm of his hand just every single time. I love it. I love, first I love comedy in general, but like, I still love watching comedy and I love watching live comedy. So when I get a chance, I will sit and watch my friends when they're performing or mm -hmm. watch new people perform. I love comedy. See, it Absolutely. Is passion. And, and so, you learn all the time. Do you feel like it, just watching everybody, I feel like I'm absorbing everything. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's fabulous. And we love comedy. So it's like, time. yeah, yeah, being surrounded by that vibe. I really miss that. Don't you miss th that now? So much. Oh. It, people, as much as as much as you guys miss us performing, we miss performing. It's yeah, we it's, it's it tough. so much. Zoom shows, as much as I've had fun with them, they're not the same. No. You know, outdoor performances. I've only done one outdoor performance. How, how was it? It was it was fun. It was it was an amazing way to sort of scratch that itch where I was like, yeah, oh, I gotta, I gotta yeah. Out there. I got to get in front of people. Ah, uh, um, I know. Now with the baby, I'm you know taking some weeks just to get used to mom life. But sure. now, like, I, I just miss it. I miss being on stage. I miss working out material. I miss being with my friends in a comedy club, just, you know, eating late night food that's terrible for oh. you. Know, and talking about comedy or trashing the audience if they suck. Oh, yes. Sometimes you guys suck. Uh, <laughs> Talking shit is the most fun part after the yeah. show harping on on whatever set like you're working on you're working a late night set or you're working on something like yeah i even miss seeing people i hate haters <laughs> I, the people I, that I, know. Know. I miss seeing the people that hate me like i miss you haters i miss, I you. <laughs> I miss seeing you and being like oh so and so hates me i miss doing that oh that's hilarious no i, I totally feel you i know <laughs> That's oh, I miss hilarious. everything about it, but the, the tour was, oh, I mean, what an amazing time. I literally just, I just sat there and took it all in. I can, and God bless Gabriel. He's so, he's so patient with me because I'm such a weird character. No, why are you weird? I'm not very social. Really? Uh, I'm not. I'm not a very social person outside of comedy. I don't like to go out. Mm. I don't like, and him and the guys would want to go to dinner and stuff. And I'd be like, don't stay in my room. And like, I, God bless me, so patient with me. Such a wonderful person. Oh. Um, Cause he really has to like, like they knew in order to get me to come out and hang out. Yeah. Gabriel would have to text me himself and be like, come to dinner. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, fine. I'm such a whole <laughs> I, I have a lot of social anxiety outside of comedy. Really? Yeah, which is really weird for a lot of people to hear, but I know a lot of comics that are like that. But like, when it comes to comedy, I'm in the driver's seat. I'm in control. Yeah. Um, outside of that, if I'm, I don't like going to bars, I don't like going to clubs. I don't yeah. like, I get very antsy. I don't like parties or anything like that. Oh yeah, they're boring. Yeah, I prefer to I prefer comics. You know, it's like, if you're having comic friends, I think what happens is because the way we speak to each other is so different than the way we have to speak to normal people. We forget and how to communicate <laughs> yes. with you daywalkers. <laughs> we forget how to talk to regular human beings because, you know, sometimes I'll forget somebody doesn't know that I'm a comedian and I'll throw out like a sarcastic line and I can see the <laughs> yeah, they're like, Whoa. And I'm like, oh God, you're a, you're a regular human. That's right. I know. They're like totally baffled. Like, what did you say? Yeah. What did you just say to me? And I'm like, yeah. Oh, oh. I know. I know. But if you say to another comic, they're like, oh, thank you. Like, you can insult us. I've just ruined this person's night. Oh. <laughs> yes. Sorry, my oh, maybe, maybe they learned something. We don't know. Yeah. Right. Right. I know. So I would love to talk about your podcast because I know you started it in 2019 and it's called um, Mess in Progress, right? Yes, Mess in Progress. Mess in Progress. So tell me, what is the podcast about? Basically how we're all messes in progress. Nobody, is, nobody has their life set like at every different level of this. I feel like none of us know what we're doing. We're just all throwing <laughs> whatever we can to the wall, hoping it sticks. And, 
I just feel like we need to connect on that more than try to push it down and hide it and act like we all we all wear these masks that make us look like we have it all together and <laughs> yeah, the podcast is a nice way of removing that mask and going psych actually <laughs> i have no idea what i'm doing <laughs> I have no yeah. idea what's going on uh and it's been such an amazing experience i you know for years people were like oh do a podcast do a podcast do a podcast and i always put it off because i was like oh there's too many podcasts out there no right. one's gonna care if i do a podcast and I think that kind of mentality is, it, it really, it's so bad for all of us to have that little yeah. voice in our head and um, coming from a history of abuse and, you know, in a past relationship, I think right. you always have that, if you've ever had that happen to you, if you've ever been in an abusive relationship, you yeah. always have that little voice in the back of your abuser that tells you that you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that, that'll be lame, that won't work out. And so I think for a very long time, I put it off for that reason. Mm -hmm. And um, then finally, I decided, you know, I'm going to just do it. I'm just going to yeah. start this okay. podcast. And so I uh, originally started it at Stand Up Labs, and now I'm doing it via Zoom and, and everything. Because uh, we were going to take it to another studio, but then the whole pandemic happened. So now we've been, season two of the podcast has all been via Zoom, which is kind of cool because yeah. now we have a Patreon and you can join to watch the videos. And it's our first time, me and my co-host, Slash producer Catherine, um, who's amazing at what she does, we've you know really had a lot of fun playing with the whole being on Zoom thing and mm -hmm. having a Patreon, and we've gotten some amazing guests. And you know, even for the first the first season of the podcast, we had amazing guests that were like just we lucked out. We got Ida Rodriguez. We got um, oh great uh, New York City talents came through, and so like. It was it was an amazing experience, and it just continues now as it grows to that next level of you know now having a Patreon. Now we have a video aspect. Now we have this and that. Um, as it grows, I feel like we grow as podcast people, me and Catherine, and things are just getting tighter and fun. And it's all, I I can honestly say that I have so much fun with it. It really is such a fun experience. I love it. And I love that uh, you give some sound homegirl advice. Yes, we do. So, <laughs> so tell me about like what home sound homegirl advice would you give to women who are in the dating jungle today? Oh, man. Um, watch your six. Uh, besides the fact that no, it's not always about knowing what you want. Mm. I think it's more so about knowing what you don't want anymore. I like that in the dating world, like when I went out there, I didn't know what I was looking for in a partner, but I knew what I didn't want anymore. I didn't want to feel judged. I didn't want to feel controlled. I definitely didn't want to feel back in that, like like I was back in an abusive relationship. Right. Um, I wanted my own independence. Uh, I wanted to be able to have my own thing and not have somebody who judged me for it. With, you know, with my ex, it was always, I was berated for having a career. I was berated for choosing my career um, and choosing to be so dedicated to it. And so I think knowing what you don't want anymore, if you're in that dating world, yeah. knowing what you don't want anymore in a relationship is a good place to start because those are easy signs to tell when you're with somebody. And you just, one of the things that I was big on when I was single too was in, in you know, I think we briefly kind of touched on it before is about wasting time. I would tell yeah. guys who would go on a date with, I'd be like, I don't have a lot of time. So the yeah. fact that I'm giving you this time, exactly. please appreciate it and don't disrespect my time because I'm giving you this time and I don't have a lot of it. I'm not, you know, yeah. myself on the back. I'm being realistic that time is something I cannot get back. Absolutely. If you yeah. wasted my time. Yep then you've done the most disrespectful thing you can do. Thank you, thank you. The dating world, you've wasted yeah. my time. I agree 100%. That's the worst, and that's what makes me mad when they do that, really. I don't wanna be their friends anymore. Uh, so we talked about, you were talking about an abusive relationship. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm very much into um, you know healing from abusive relationships, so, um, I want to ask you a couple of questions, if that's okay with you. Sure, yeah. Okay, so how long were you were um, in that relationship? Seven years. Seven years, damn. Um, when did you realize that you were in an abusive relationship? When was that moment that you were like, 
damn. Realistically, it wasn't until after, even though several mm -hmm. people told me while I was in it. Of course. It wasn't until I was, I had started going to therapy probably about a month after our breakup um, because a very dear friend of mine, um, thank God for real friends, for good friends. Um, he noticed tell you the truth. Yeah, he noticed something I had posted online and he got very concerned about me. Mm. And he called me and he said, I want you to go see my therapist. And I said, all right. Turned out to be a therapist I had seen when I was in uh, a relationship when I was like 19. So it turned out to be the same guy, wow. uh, which was just a weird coincidence. But um, I remember sitting in his office and this was after, you know, the, the abusive relationship had ended a few months after that, sitting in his office and and my therapist telling me, he goes, you know, you were in an abusive relationship. And I literally, I went, no. Of course. Just like that, I went, no. I went, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not a weak person. I'm not, I don't get abused. And, you know, I realized that first of all, it, a lot of very strong, intelligent women get into abusive relationships. Yep. Um, I think I looked at it like, well, I couldn't possibly be because I'm not this, you know, demure, dainty person that gets pushed around. Like, right. I'm not, I'm, I have a mouth on me. I'm, you know, <laughs> right. I have an attitude. Like, I'm right. a very strong willed person. Like, I told myself all those things. And when I stepped back and, and looked at that relationship, I was like, yeah, I was that in all other aspects of my life, except. For that relationship wow it was so easy for me to find that person that i thought i think for a lot of women what happens like a lot of women like me or a lot of women that you know you know like to think of themselves as strong independent women what we end up looking for in a partner is that person that we can hand the reins over to that can take over for us the problem is we end up finding somebody who holds on to those reins and doesn't let them go and I thought like that's where mm -hmm. it actually happened was like I found somebody who one found me at a very vulnerable moment in my I was going through a very difficult breakup mm -hmm. and completely like as this relationship was like falling apart like you know I, I will say this was a little predatory right and um that's nobody's fault. It was a situation like I can't say that I, I was obviously somewhat had to be aware of, of the predatory nature of what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, I do take my hand in the responsibility of it. But also, once I was in it, I had been in such a low place yeah. that I was so easy to keep in that low place. Yes. And I think that's what it was. It was so easy to make me think because, you know, now that we know more about gaslighting, now that we know more about how emotional abuse works with somebody, because this was an emotionally abusive relationship. And course, there's no yes. category, yeah, there's no category of abuse that is greater or less than. And no. a relationship is an abusive relationship. There's just a difference in what scars you carry from it, you know. Yeah. Um, for some of us, it's always going to, I mean, there's always going to be emotional scars, whether it was emotional abuse or physical abuse. You know, we carry those scars with us forever we carry that voice with us for a very long time yes and if had i not gone to therapy had i not i mean my therapist truly 100 percent saved my life wow i such an advocate for therapy because i was in i mean i was when i was in this relationship i was suicidal i hated myself um, oh god i'm sorry it, it well it's a thing that i feel like the more that we talk about it the more other people can feel safe talking about it too. Yes. And I think that there's no reason like, well, do I talk about it and do I get sad? Not really, because I think if I was still in that place, mm -hmm. I would feel sad because I hadn't graduated to a different part of who I am as a person. But the fact that I can look back, I, I feel bad for what other people had to witness me go through. Because right. the people closest to me, so many of them saw what was going on and tried to pull me out of it, his own family included. Wow, his own family wanted to get yeah. out. And stubborn <laughs> and weak as I was at that point, you really believe you can change somebody. 
because what happened? Oh, always, and you always remember how they were in the beginning, the first six months to nine months, they're like, they sweep you off your feet. They're like perfection. You're like, oh my God, yeah. right? When and then to you, switch. When someone's awful to you a good percentage of the time, mm -hmm. the moments where they're good to you, you magnify them. So exactly. the yeah. of, of goodness you might get, you go, yeah. oh my God, wow, he didn't yell at me today. Oh yeah, I used to go home butterflies in my stomach like okay am i going to do something that will trigger him and i it could be anything it could be leaving uh my cell phone on the table i mean which is nothing to do with anything and whenever he was good i was like oh good well maybe there's hope and whenever yeah. he was mean to me you know and then i figured out okay he's angry now and i would excuse him like he's angry because his son did this he's angry because this happened he's angry and i'm like that's bullshit. He's just angry, <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. and you tell things like, you know, he's right. I don't do enough, you know. Yeah. He's right. I should. I should be more like this. I mean, it's just an endless checklist of things that of of reasons why you're you're uh, worthy of his anger and unworthy. Totally. totally. Yes. Yes. Always. You Always. Give yourself that yeah. checklist of like, this is why I deserve this behavior. Yes. And that's why, like, when uh, I'm never shy about talking about it. You know what I, I mean? Love that. I don't, I don't wish him any ill will. I no. have no, like, I hope he's grown as a person, just like I've been on my own journey to grow as a person. Mm -hmm. I only hope that people get better. I never want to see somebody suffer because wishing suffering on anybody else is such a sign of immaturity where it's like, no, I don't want you to suffer, man. Like, it's, it, is it something that like on the, on the big chalkboard of my life, is it something that I wish I could erase? Yeah, to a certain extent, I wish I could erase some of the emotional stuff that is still stuck in there, the gun. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It stays but, with you for a long time, yeah. But the That's fact is who I was then and what I went through then built the person I am now. So how can I be mad at that? And how can I ask for that to go away? Because if that were to go away, that would to mean I would never gone to therapy. I may have never met my husband. I may have never, you know what I mean? Like there's so many things I may have never done had I not grown from the person I was in that relationship. Um, I think it's important too that I not shy away from talking about it when people ask me yeah. about it because yeah. too many people do shy away from it. Yes. Yeah. And then, or they feel shame. I felt yeah. shame. You know, my mom saw a lot of things that were going on. And I felt you met my mom uh, and yeah. remember at the show and she loved you, by the way, absolutely oh, wow. loved you. You were her favorite oh, wow. um, of all that in all that show. And um, so my mom saw it and I was ashamed. I told my mom pretty much everything. She was like my best friend and I was embarrassed to tell her the shit he did to me. And when she saw it, she stood up for me because she couldn't believe it. What he was, yeah. he would attack me about it, like, you know how they do it about anything, the stupidest thing, and they justify the anger. Oh yeah, I would get compared yeah. all the time to uh, other female comics. Oh, he would say stuff like, this person's gonna be more successful than you. Oh my she's God. Gonna, she's younger, she's prettier, she's this, she's that. Um, but at the same time, if I were too busy, oh, you care about your career more than you care about me. You don't You don't love me. How could you love me if you work so much? And it's, it just, it, it was a constant, you're just never happy with anything I do. It's Nothing, just, absolutely. From the stupidest things to the big thing, to your career, you know, they're never happy. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's the way to keep you controlled. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Making you feel like you're lesser than or making you feel, <laughs> having you walking on eggshells because, you know, yeah. you're dealing with this difficult to please person. It's just like, oh. that's what life was like for a very long time. and. Mm -hmm. That's why I know for a fact that anybody who's been through it, you just, you magnify the good times because I've been through it. Right. I would magnify every time we had a good day or every time there was a sweet mm -hmm. moment that was made out to be so much bigger than it was because it was all I had to hold on to. Right. I, I agree. A hundred percent. Yeah. And were you always scared? Like, I remember I was always scared to go home and terrified. I was, um, I definitely got that way because I think at first the biggest issue was um, that I do have a mouth on me. 
Yeah, same here. Yeah, they don't like that. And he learned a way to tame that. Oh yeah, they tame. Yeah, they. It's almost like they. It's a war. And at the end of my relationship, I said, you know what, you win. And he was like, what are you talking about? I said, I don't know. You win. I give up. I'm not fighting anymore. Yeah. I remember telling, um, both telling my ex and knowing this, saying, um, you're not happy unless this ends with me crying. Wow. And it got to the point where I would just get to the crying quicker. Wow. I would, just, I would just get to it quicker because I was like, I just want this over with. I don't want to be in this anymore. Well, I think they feed off of our negative emotions. They're like vampires, you know, they yeah. like, and that's how they provoke us. You know, they, they know they push our buttons and they know yeah. how to keep us low, you know, like low. In the, and mine was a, a known character actor. So he had that entitlement and he felt he was better. You know, so it's, uh, yeah. So I had that too going on. Lovely. Yeah. 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 I mean, I remember um, the moment when my um, my ex let it slip uh, as to how how he manipulates people. He let it slip oh. in the conversation we were having where he was just like, I know exactly what to say to people to get the response that I want. Wow. And I remember thinking like in that moment, like every going over every single argument we'd ever had and going, oh my goodness, I fell for it every time. I felt I took the bait every single time. You yeah. know exactly what to get, what to say to get me to an emotional erratic state where I could no longer make rational decisions or yeah. speak rationally. And I would be provoked to the point of tears and screaming. Yeah. So I look like an insane person. Totally, totally. And, and you come out of those relationships not even knowing who you are anymore. Like, I was like, I don't even know what I want, who I am, what happened, what, you know, it's just horrendous. Or differentiate between somebody caring about you versus somebody being controlling. Exactly. So how did you get over that? Like, because I'm sure after that, I don't know if this happened to you. I'm afraid. I'm always like on the lookout for signs and I'm always afraid that that's going to, they're going to blow up on me. That's my bigger mm -hmm. fear, you know? And, and so when you da started dating your husband, you're now husband. Uh, how did you get over that fear of, you know, maybe he, he will be the same as the other guy? Well, I mean, I went against type number one. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> good. I went completely against type because oh. I realized that I had such a thing for a specific type of person mm. who always ended up having this like alpha male mentality and as somebody who's totally an alpha female, as somebody who's totally mm -hmm. in that category, when I am put up against somebody who is also an alpha, mm -hmm. there's a lot of headbutting and control issues. A hundred, like two goats. Yeah. Yeah. Especially somebody who, and there's a difference between somebody who is an alpha in like a certain aspect of their life and they can control that and be like, okay, cool. And then kind of take that off when they go home and go, all right, I can be a chill mm -hmm. person now which is much more how I am for it. Like I can take this off and be like, all right, I'm chill. I just want to be home. I just, I don't need to run nothing. I just, I'll be fine. Um, I think I looked for people who were the opposite of a lot of what I looked for in the past. And what I found was, again, going, going with what I don't want. I was like, what I don't want is somebody who is super flirtatious with anything that they're attracted to, because I know the insecurities that sets off in me. Mm -hmm. I also know the disrespect that can happen, whether intentional or unintentional, when somebody is naturally flirtatious and I've dealt with that before. Yeah. Um, also having come from certain experiences, I knew I was already a jealous person because of this reason, that reason. And I'm jealous to the point of like not, I'm jealous if I feel like you are purposefully disrespecting my relationship. Sure. That's the type of jealous. I am. And so, I had to look for people and like what I loved about like my husband when I first when I first met him and really was getting to know him is one, he's much more social than I am. He likes to go out, he likes to talk to people, he's incredibly friendly. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm the exact opposite. If I'm out, I am the person in the corner not talking to anybody. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you if you don't know me. I'm very friendly if you come up to me, but I'm very cool if you never come up to me at all. 
<laughs> he was the person that would go up to everybody and was so nice and buys people drinks and hangs out with new people. And I love that about him. Nice. Um, he was also, I mean, he's also remarkably talented. My husband's a musician. And oh. um, first couple of times I got to see him play, I just, there's something that comes out as a performer. There's something that comes across in somebody's personality when you see them on stage. And yeah. what I saw in him was this huge heart. Mm -hmm. There was so much heart in what he did. Oh. Heart in his performance that I just, every time I would watch him perform, I'd just be floored because he put everything into it. All of his being is put into it. And as oh, somebody who is so obsessed with stand up and loves comedy and is the same way, I, I loved the passion that I saw him put into what he was doing. And I still love to watch him to this day when he puts, you know, when he's putting on a show. And, um, we were also, one thing I will say too that helped a lot is being very open about mm -hmm. everything I had been through and everything I was going through to change. I told my husband, you know, I remember, and here's a big sort of telltale sign of this, this is the good, this is the right person. Yeah. Where I told my husband that I was seeing a therapist and he sort of like paused and he was like, why are you seeing a therapist? And I went, well... I was in an abusive relationship and I am working through that and a lot of other things. He sort of sat back and he was like, and I could tell he was thinking and he goes, you know, if you ever wanted me to come with you to therapy, I would do that. Oh. And just the fact that that was his response, like. Total love. Really, yeah my heart just melted that it was it, there was no judgment there was no this chick is out of her mind there was this just this person might need my support i love that that's beautiful and so i just remember really being thankful that that was his response and it was it was amazing and you know we've grown and you know we're still we're still a regular couple we still have we still have arguments. We see, you know, we get mad at each other. Well, we communicate a lot better. Um, and really it's because of him that I communicate a lot better because I realized I was a crap communicator. <laughs> Sometimes you got to admit that stuff about yourself. Girl, it's a skill. It's a skill. It's uh, it's a learning it's, process. It's really hard. <laughs> it's, I've realized so many things about myself, so many things that I want to fix. I love um, that. Yeah. About myself and, and through this relationship. And, you know, it's never easy because you're combining two lives, you're combining two personalities. So it's never easy, but some things are worth the work. And mm -hmm. yes, one of those things where it's like, this is worth the work. And you have Absolutely. to find that person that's worth the work of a relationship, that's mm -hmm. worth the work of setting up a life together. Exactly. You know, and if you know that this person that you're dating and it's not, it's not a question of the person's individual worth. It's about looking at a dating situation and going, is what this person giving me worth the work that it will take to build a relationship with them? Meaning if you're giving me 20% to the 80% I'm giving, right? then this is clearly unbalanced and I should not pursue anything with you because all you're willing to give is that 20%. I'm giving you 80% now and we're just dating. That 100% is coming once we take this to the next level. Mm -hmm. But if, if you can't find somebody that matches what you're willing to give, then you have to realistically take a step back. And it's so hard to do that in the single world because you want companionship. You yeah. want to be with somebody. You don't want to be alone. Maybe you hooked up with a friend and you really like this friend, but you can see the telltale signs. Of this isn't going to work out, so you lie to yourself repeatedly. Yeah, about where this is going to go, you know, it's so hard to take that step back, but it's so essential to. I mean, and I learned that lesson several times throughout my dating, my short lived dating life, whole phase, everything. That I, as many lies as I told myself about where I could take things with people that were clearly not on the same page as me. So when me and my husband met, we sort of laid it all out. I was very honest with him. I laid it all out. I was like, look, um, I think I met him when I was like 35. I'm like, I'm 35. I don't have time to have this yeah. back and forth 
you know, we're not playing games here. Right. Do we want a relationship or is this just something where we, we're casually seeing each other and then this will fizzle out? If you're not looking for anything, just tell me right now. So that way, if this fizzles out, I already know. I don't have to worry about it. Exactly. Good. Very upfront and honest. The problem is not everybody will be upfront and honest with you, like back with you. Yeah. I think if you're willing to lay it out on the table and go like, look, this is what I'm looking for. Yeah. You have if to. This isn't realistically what you're looking for, mm -hmm. let me know now and I'll yeah. make my decision based on that. Maybe we can casually see each other. Maybe we can't. Exactly. This is what I'm looking for. Yeah, I agree 100%. That's the best way to do it. I do it all the time. It's like, what do you want from me? What are you looking for? You know, just tell me the truth. I'm, there's no judgment. Just tell me. And then we'll take it from there. I'll tell you what I want and what I'm looking for. And we'll see if we match. Yeah. And that's that's really the bottom line. And ladies, believe what you are told. Yes! <laughs> man told you, I am not looking for a relationship. <laughs> Do not think you will magically change his mind. Thank you. You can't change anybody. I was that girl for a very long time. That was like, well, he hasn't dated me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. he has. He's dated several versions of you and none of those <laughs> versions of him. Well, my ex met his future wife at a party that we were together at, right? We broke up three months later. And then he started dating a good friend of mine saw them like a week after I moved out. She's like, girl, I didn't want to tell you, but and I was like, what? <laughs> so yeah. It's he found somebody else to leech off of, you know, to like yeah. be statistically abusive to watch. Just... Well, you know what I think what I always hope is my my ex is, is married now. And uh even when I found out about it, I think I was hurt when I found out about it because it happened pretty quickly after. Um, it was, it was pretty clear that something had been going on before mm -hmm. when we had split. And, um, I remember being very upset about it, but also, you know, after going through the healing process and being in therapy, also being like, you know what, that's not my problem anymore. Right. Like it's not, if, if this person has changed, you know what? Good on you. I hope you've changed. I hope mm -hmm. you have a better, healthier relationship than any relationship you've ever been in before. And if this person hasn't changed, then it's not my problem. It's Absolutely. Not my problem anymore. I've yes. done my time. My time is up. Yes. I'm out. I got yes. out good behavior. I did my time. I'm good. And yeah. That's all you can take it as. It's like I can't look back on it and be like, you know, I think. In the beginning, did it sting? Yeah, but my friend, my friend um, Dante, he he put it really perfectly. I remember calling him and being very upset that my ex was getting married, and he really and you gotta appreciate, you know, people for the little tidbits of, of things they give you that are true gems. Yes. And I was so upset, and he said, "Tina, come on, you don't want to be with this." You don't want to be with this guy. You're not angry because, you know, you're not you you're not marrying this person. You're angry because you did the time and she got the ring. Yeah. I was like, oh, it was like, yes. oh. I love that girl. It That's was like, like God, that was the stone cold truth. I did the time, but she got the ring, and I oh, looked at it like she got the prize that I worked hard for. Oh shit! That's like, oh my god! It just hit me. Wow. Genius. I love it. Yeah, it was a, a really, I just remember that moment so clearly being like, yeah. oh, damn it. Like, yeah. you, you're right. You're yeah. right. I don't want to be with this person. No, you don't want to, but you're like, er, right? But yeah, the no. anger is like, you know, you you got that that winning prize that I was, that I had my heart set on for those amount of years. Yeah. And no matter how unhealthy the relationship was. So it was just like, oh, that that, those gems of truth, you got to take those. I love it. Realize, you know what? That person was absolutely right, no matter how much it stung. Absolutely. Well, the way I saw it is since they started dating like a week after we broke up, you know, a friend of mine told me, look at it as she did you a favor because now he's unavailable. He's with yeah. that person. So you can't get him even if you want to backslide, so to speak. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, I miss him because, you know, we go through that, right? So now I can't yeah. do it. I think I, I, I may have sort of gone through it this at this. Mm -hmm. um, yes and no, because I think 
we had broken up once before. And I think I had said when we got back together, I was like, yeah, if we do this again, that, you know, and we end up breaking up, like I'm done for good. Right. Like I'm out, I'm done, mm -hmm. you know? And I think I, so I really stuck to that. Like this time I was like, yeah, there's no, we're not friends. Like I'm not no. I'm chill with you. We're not staying connected. No. You know, you're blocked from this, 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 and this. I won't see you anymore. Um, Absolutely. It's necessary sometimes to have that clean break of like, yeah. I can't, yes. I can't even give you a window because no. you will manipulate the situation to get yep. out there. Um, totally. What happened the first time we'd broken up. And so I think that's essential too. Like if you're going through a difficult breakup and that's the reason why you're single now, you cannot leave the window open. No, I you agree 100%. Block, block, block. It, it hurts, but yeah. you cannot yeah. leave that window open. Yeah. It's like you're, you have some kind of growth and you have to like <laughs> cut it out. And it's gonna hurt when you cut, but once it starts healing and you don't have that thing anymore, you're like, that was worth you'll look it. Back on it, and you'll be like, that was the best decision I ever made. Was completely yeah. cutting that person off. I agree, a hundred percent. So I, I feel like um, you would have been a really good therapist, and you say that in your comedy special that if you wouldn't have been a comedian, you would have been a relationship therapist. I would have loved to be a relationship therapist because I'm nosy and opinionated. <laughs> That's true. I'm nosy and opinionated. I want to tell y'all how to live your life. All the time. Oh my God. That's hilarious. I love that. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like I've made enough relationship and life mistakes that I feel like I'd be less of a therapist and more of a person that's like, don't do that. I did that. Don't do that. That is not, that is not a smart move. I've done that. And that messes up your life. Um, but I would, I just, I've always been obsessed with relationships. Um, just as obsessed yeah. as I was with comedy, I was always obsessed with relationships and how relationships work. Like I was the person that anytime I meet a new couple, I'm like, how did you meet? Like, I have to hear the story. That's so um, cool. Um, and do you go up and ask for advice to people? Like I do that with my friends. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll ask All the time. for advice, so, you know, yeah. it's really my girlfriends because I have some of the realest girlfriends ever. My best friend, oh. he's he's super real with me. You know, my, my, uh, my best friend, I mean, I love him to pieces. He's the kind of person that if, if he will always tell me the 100% absolute truth, whether I want to hear it or not, he will always tell me. And I, I guarantee That's a friend, you, for real, yeah. But he also has my back. And yeah. so having that in a friend, having that even in my girlfriends, being able to turn to them and tell them, they'll they'll be honest with me. If they, They'll be like, Gina, no, this is a you thing. You're, you're at fault here. <laughs> you, you need yeah. to fix me. Yeah, you're being a bitch. I had yeah. two girlfriends saying about somebody that I'm um, kind of whatever. Uh, they're like, you know that you were a bitch before. It's one of those that were back yes. together kind of. And they're like, you know, that you were really a bitch. Two people told me that. I'm like, oh, you were a bitch to him. Yeah, you know what I was. <laughs> my brother is like that too. Like my brother will, you know, my brother is yeah. hilarious. Well, my brother is definitely the kind of person to be like, mm, calm down. You're being a problem. <laughs> We like, love those people that keep it real for us. 100%. Oh my that. God. I, I adore them. I would not be able to, I, I don't, I don't want fake friends. No, there's a lot of fake people out there. I don't want them. Yes, there are. Well, I'll talk to them, but that's it. Um, so one thing that also you talk about in the comment special is um, your sense, you have a, a sense of mission. Like you want to help. What is, what do you feel is your mission on this earth? Man, I guess you say mission or, or purpose or, you know, in, in the floor is lava. I talk about it at the end of the special, um, mm -hmm. just wanting people to know, um, or rather to believe in themselves and to go for their dreams, man. I mean, I love it. it sounds, you know, just cliche and corny to say, go for your dreams. But the fact is, I don't think we're, I still don't think we're encouraged enough as individuals to go for it i think we're fed fear for such a long time and yes um we get used to it and we sit in that we never really go for what we want in life yeah. um and then that goes for everything i'm not just talking career wise like what kind of life do you want and are you setting yourself on a path to try and achieve those goals mm -hmm. you know, do you want to be more confident do you want to be you know do you want a better job do you, you know 
and all of these things are attainable even if it is difficult they are attainable it's just mm -hmm. do you have um, the willpower to stick with it yeah and to constantly constantly reinforcing yourself that i can do this i know i can do this mm -hmm. and i think having been like that my whole life where it's like mm -hmm. I, can do, I know i can do this you know i'm like the little kid that sees a steep hill the little chubby girl that sees like a steep hill and goes, I know I can do this. I'm gonna have a heart attack halfway up, but I know I can I can make it up yeah. the steep yeah. hill. Even and if people know. tell you, you know, they, they but this there's a rock over there and there's yeah. like this, and I'm like, I don't care. I'll yeah. figure it out. <laughs> I'm going to make it up this damn hill. Yeah. Even if it oh. takes me three weeks where it takes some other girl, you know, three hours. I will, I'm going to make it up this hill. And I think it's so important that um, Absolutely. people know that. I, you know, in the special I talk about, you know, there was, I had no help. Mm. There was nothing special about me. I had no, you know, you know, I wasn't ahead of anybody financially. I wasn't super intelligent. It's not any of those things. What I had was just this, I, I just didn't quit. I didn't yeah. quit. That's all it was. I didn't quit. The importance of not quitting. Yeah. 100%. A hundred percent. Even if it feels like, and especially in this business, in the entertainment business, it feels like, oh my, you look back and you're like, I mean, it happens to me now to you, I'm sure. But like, I look back, I'm like, I've done shit, but then I want to do more. And I feel like well, it's the same you know, I'm not I'm happy. happy. I guess yeah. I've done that, but what's next? What is what the, next? You know, right. Like, like what is the next challenge, right? You know, when you look back on it, and I've had people, you know, when I, you know, tell them how I started in comedy and everything, and they're like, wow, like, how did you do all that? And I'm like, I didn't think about it. I just did. That's right. I love that. Yeah. You because can't I think too much. I would have thought about it. I yeah. would have given myself a heart attack. I would have talked myself out of it. I just did it. I just, yeah. I was like, this is what I got to do. I'm going to do it. No matter how tired I am, no matter yeah. what I have to sacrifice, I'm going to do it. I love it. That's what it takes. And it, it shows. Look how all the stuff that you've done. It's amazing. All your accomplishments. I mean, you're super talented. And I'm just so proud of you because I've, I've you know, I've known you for 15 years. And it's just, I'm so happy for you. Thank you so much. It's so yeah. great to see what everybody's doing, man. Like, I love the fact that none of the people, yourself included, like, that I've known throughout the years, none of us are quitters, man. Like, no, no. Oh, we're, we're not. Quitters. We're all working and figuring out as we go yeah. and we have wins and we have losses and, you know, you, you, you know, you can feel the pain of the loss and celebrate the win. You can do all of it, but as long as you just keep going. And I think that's, that's right. been amazing. I just got to work with Shayla again when I did the HBO thing. And Oh, really? Shayla Rivera? Yeah. Oh my gosh. We did. That was the funniest Latinas was she was on it. Cause I did it twice that yeah. show. Okay, so then that one, she was there. Yeah. Oh my God, you got so to work so with her. Amazing. Yeah, it's so amazing to see where everybody is at and what everybody's doing. And you know, I don't. I just love that feeling of like, oh, look at what so and so is doing. Like, I love seeing it. It's, it's, I know, isn't it fun? Yeah, it's so I nice know. to see people continue to win, and I love it. And you know, everybody wins. Every every win should be celebrated. I don't care if it's a tiny right. little win. You know. Sometimes it's, you know, it's as much as getting a call back for something and you're like, I got a call back. And it's like, yeah, oh, no. yes. celebrate that. You got a call back. Yes, you did that. <laughs> I love it. You know, we've been talking for like an hour and a half. This is like the longest yeah. interview and I could talk to you for another hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can do this again soon. Yeah, and we can talk about yeah. other stuff. I would love to have you on again. You're such an amazing human being. I love you to pieces. Thank you. I love you to pieces too. Thank you so much Thank for having me on. This was great. My, this was amazing. And, and your experience and your being so candid and, and honest about your experiences will help other people that are watching. I can tell by the comments too. So uh, that's just Thank you, a Thank you everybody that's commenting too. Uh, hey Vic, hey Kyle, I love you guys. Thank you. And Gilbert, I saw you somewhere in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, Dave, too, the guy was asking about the fluffy tour. Thank you so much. Um, oh, nice. Nice. Uh, so tell us where can they listen to your podcast? Where can they find you on social media? What are your handles? Oh, excellent. Yeah. Um, 
you can find me. Uh, I'm mainly on Instagram. I play around with TikTok. So uh, Instagram and TikTok. Uh, TikTok is at Gbrion80, I believe. And Instagram is at Gbrion. Um, Facebook is Gina Brion. Twitter is Gina Brion. Everything else, the website is GinaBrion.com. Um, uh, you can catch The Floor is Lava and Pacifically Speaking, both on Amazon. The Floor is Lava is my newest special. Yeah. Um, coming out on this month on the 20th, which I believe is your birthday. Oh, um, my God, yeah. August 20th. Yeah. Your special is coming up? I have an yeah. HBO. It's not a special. It's a set that I did while I was pregnant. So you'll get to see me in all my pregnant glory. Oh, my God. Rocking the most fabulous set of heels. Yeah. Um, oh, I can't. Or, I've noticed that you were like huge, like tall. Wow. Oh, my God. HBO I, Mac, I, on HBO oh. Max, <laughs> part of the Hot Comedy Festival, which was hosted by Angela Johnson, whom I absolutely adore. Oh, I love Angela. I've known her forever. Mm -hmm. Oh, just. And just features so many great comics. It's me, Jesus Trejo, Mark Vieira, uh, Monique Marvez. Like, it's just a oh, great Monique, she's great. Yeah. So check that out, HBO Max. Uh, on the 20th, check out the floor is lava, and you can listen to uh, my podcast, Mess in Progress, on iTunes and all the other podcast platforms. Um, so listen to it. We have a Patreon, Mess in Progress. You can sign up, become a member, and you can see the videos from this season's uh, uh, Mess in Progress with some of our very fun guests. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on Love at First Laugh, and <laughs> it was so great to catch up with you. Yeah, and, it's great to talk with you and catch up. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. And, and we're definitely going to do this again. Absolutely.